Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, it is almost 9.15, and uh, we have a lot of really good stuff on the agenda. And so um, I just to talk a little bit of an overview of um, kind of highlighting the Green Step City best practice actions related to energy. And um, I, I really don't need to go through and read each of them. That would be silly. What I will do is include in the follow-up a link um, or some information about if you're looking for energy-related best practices, um, where to find some of that. And um, I guess basically just to know that there are many of the categories. There's not an energy category. Um, so they fit into energy efficiency. They fit into community development and renewable energy. They fit in a lot of different places. Um, and CERT um, plays the, the role mostly on uh, clean energy, energy efficiency, renewables um, with regard to the Green Tech Cities, in addition to a lot of outreach and other things that we do. So we're the go-to people. This is um, one of the at least a best practice advisor for at least one or more of the best practices. Um, and she'll be talking later. So um, I don't know that I need to you know, kind of go through them really deeply, um, but I think it's important to know that, again, best practices are in many different categories. And that's part of why we're doing these workshops, is to highlight different best practice areas and different um, actions and um, lessons learned and um, things, especially peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning from cities about what's working and not working, and um, you know, some of that. So um, I think, does anybody care that I'm not going to read all of these? Yeah. Okay, just, just checking in case you wanted to see that. Um, but I will say that um, there are hashy flyers um, that are for the whole workshop series on the table here. Grab a few. If you want to share them, make, you know, go and register for the future workshops. Um, they're every month on the third Wednesday in this very room. Um, the one in January is being led by my colleague um, down the street. We live three blocks from each other through the tunnel. So um, my neighbor, Phil, uh, will be working on the January one and it's um, focused on protecting and utilizing our water resources. So stormwater, rainwater um, as a resource. And um, so he'll be focusing on, on that workshop and that is on January 21st. So um, sign up. And then the one after that is energy related again, really focused on uh, reducing energy efficiency in the community uh, kind of commercial industrial sector, um, which Great Plains where I work and certain and others um, have done a lot of work on in the community. So um, with that, um, I also just want to say that um, while there are not kind of uh, documents from Excel at this point, brochures or flyers about the community seller program, um, Yvonne brought um, what she has is a PowerPoint and um, she has a few copies of them, but we will include the PDF in the follow-up, so you will all have that. Um, if you have to have a hard copy before you leave today, I would wrestle with Yvonne as soon as this workshop is over, because she has five left. Um, but it will be in a follow-up email, um, and, you know, and so we'll send that out to folks. I think that's it. Anything else that I missed? Bathrooms are down the hall. Those of you on the phone, I know that's not helpful. Um, so with that, it is my pleasure to um, introduce my colleague, um, and some of you might know us as the Search Ladies, so my better half uh, of the Search Ladies, Lisa Polish, um, who has become our expert um, on community solar and um, for our team, and um, tries to pass the baton, but we keep passing it back to her. So um, in that vein, I should pass the baton to you. Welcome. I ran track for a lot of years, um, and I was on both the mile relay and the two mile relay. And I was very good at passing the baton and then not getting it back. I um, clearly need to take some remedial lessons on that. Um, I'm going to kind of talk through, so I know that a lot of you actually know a good bit about community solar already. Um, my role is to sort of set up the conversation for the day. So we will, are going to cover some basic things. I'm not trying to say that you don't know these things already, but because some of you do and some of you don't, I want to make sure that we're all starting on the same page. And I'm going to talk both about some of how it works with Excel Energy Program, but also how it's been working in cooperative energy territory, because a number of our friends on the phone, and maybe some of you here, are not in Excel Energy territory. Um, and there are models that are still working in those other places. So just as an overview, that's where we're starting from. OK, so next. On magic, um, for CERT, and we're here to help. I just love that sort of phrase. We're here to help. Um, but CERT um, is a partnership that Diana mentioned, and our whole role and purpose is to connect people to resources to help them identify and implement community scale energy projects. So that's on energy.
efficiency and renewable. We do everything from solar to biomass, all sorts of different stuff. Um, sorry. Um, okay, here is the Cliff Notes version of what community solar is. <laughs> okay, all of these people standing in front of a fence solar system. It wouldn't have to be fenced. Just take off the fence as you envision this. And see, every single person, it's like their little arrow is pointing to their panel that they have subscribed to. They don't own it. They subscribe to it. But this is essentially what community solar is. And it wouldn't just have to be one panel, right? They could subscribe to several different panels. But all of these people could be participating in a shared system. Let's know version. OK, everyone's not even. I think we're good. OK, let's go to the next one. There we go. OK, so here's the sort of technical definition. It is a centrally located solar PV, or photovoltaic, system that provides electricity to participating subscribers. Step one, solar panels. Note, they're put in a sunny location. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's an important, it's an important point. You snicker, but it's true. And one of the really great things that people are excited about with community solar is that this is an opportunity to do really great siting of solar systems so that you're getting that maximum production from the system. It's actually a really important point. Okay. Number two, individual entities can subscribe to enough solar to cover up to 120% of their average annual electricity usage. It can be a small subscription. It could be as small as 200 watts by statute. That would be awfully small if you were a city. I'm not sure I would bother with the administrative headache to do 200 watts. But you could. Um, but that really is sort of speaking to the small end of the range up to the big end of the range. Now, these, these projects, each individual project can be a megawatt, which again for a city might actually be maybe not enough. You couldn't maybe get all of your needs covered, so you might have to subscribe to more than one garden, but you can only get up to 120% of your average annual usage. You as an individual subscriber, can only be 40% of a garden subscription, and there must be at least five subscribers to a garden. Okay, that was a lot of fast numbers. We're going to oh, come back to that again as we keep going. Um, and then finally, the important thing to remember is that on your bill is where you would see the credit. And I'm going to get into that a bit more. But that's where, if you're participating, you'll see that credit. And Excel is actually in your PowerPoint. I don't know if it's in this version or not, Yvonne, um, but in the PowerPoint in the past days shown for how that would actually just show up on your bill. It'll show up as a credit on one of the lines on your bill. Okay. Just to reinforce, it's designed to cover your needs. Okay? It's not designed to do more than you need. It's not designed to be an energy exporter for your needs. You're not, it's not designed to help you do more and then sell additionally into the grid. It's designed to cover your needs. Um, part of what you would want to do if you were thinking about it in the sort of third pyramid way is first you would want to do all of the energy efficiency that you could possibly do. All of it. <laughs> um, so that you get your usage down as much as possible. Okay? Then you would think about how do we cover our usage with something else, and that might be solar, and that might be the subscription. But we always tell people to do the energy efficiency first. So you have your electricity use. If you can get that down, you need less solar to cover all of that need. That's a little preachy, and that's about as preachy as it'll be for the whole presentation. Yes, Laura? I would like to say that I use 400 kilowatt hours a month. So three people, three bedrooms. Yes, so this is the minutes of the average. That's not a great average. Well, but it, but it actually is the average, but some of them may be far superior, um, as I'm sure you all are. So all of the people um, from which the average is taken, you are all below average, but in a good way. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, next one, Patrick. Um, so just, and I, again, I know I'm covering the basics, but Part of the rationale for doing community solar 
is that not everybody has a great type. So everybody uses this picture on the left. I feel sorry for whomever is solar system this is, but people use this one all the time. Great, I have a house, I'm going to put a solar in. Oh, look, that tree grew. Shocking. Um, you know, you shouldn't put your solar system in the shade. That's why the siting really matters. But there are lots of people that don't have access to a good sunny site. You know, and, and having trees that help cool your home, I'm not saying, I mean, that's great. And trees are wonderful. I'm not saying cut down trees. But you don't want to put a solar system there. The other thing is that there are all sorts of people who don't own access to that roof. So people that live in a multifamily dwelling, they may not be able to put up their own solar system. Sorry. Yeah, in addition, some people aren't planning to stay in their home for 20, 30 years. They're not planning to live where they currently live for forever. And so a subscription to a community solar garden might allow them to actually take their solar with them as they move without having to install on a roof. So there's a lot of upside and a lot of rationality behind going toward community solar. The idea was it allows more people to get involved in the solar mix. Okay, next one. Patrick? Um, there are lots of players, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we keep going. But one of the things to just keep in mind is there are a lot of different people who are going to play a role in community solar. You don't have to know all of this, but I'm going to sort of boil it down to a couple of things. So a subscriber is this hot little green fella. Um, that's the individuals or the entity, could be a business, could be a local government, that subscribes to a project. And let me just reinforce, you're subscribing to a project. You don't own it. There are some community solar models out there where you actually own the panel. But those are fewer and further between and less of the model that Minnesota is having. So when you have a subscription, even if it's a pay upfront subscription, you are subscribing to get the energy benefit, not to own the system. It's an important distinction. And for some of you local government folks, that matters in terms of some of the funding that you can put toward a project. So it's just something to think about. A developer is the group that actually develops the project if it's going. They're working with the installers to get everything started. The installers is a little wrench down here. Um, a host site is where it's located. That's where the project is located. That could be on uh, Rose Mount 160 acres, for example. Um, it could be on somebody's roof. There could be both ground mount systems and roof mounted systems. There are lots of different options for that. Um, financing. Where the money comes from, um, for most of the projects that you're thinking about right now, there are going to be some sort of tax equity partner, so someone can take advantage of the 30% investment tax credit that's available for another couple of years, and that's an important component and will be probably a part of any bit of financing to move a community solar project forward. Um, the utility, there, there must be, in any, in any community solar garden project, there will be a garden operator slash developer, a utility, and at least five subscribers. Those are, the, those, are the, those are the key parts that have to be in any project. The site assessor is the one that's helping to make sure that you have a good site. I talked about the installer, and then there's the outreach partner. Many of you, whether or not you are at a city or work with a, a related group, may be thinking that that is a role that you want to play. That might be a role for, say, your environmental commission. <laughs> it might be a role for the city itself. One of the things that we've been talking about with Green Step City is that to accomplish some of the best practices in the renewable energy best practice area is that it might be that for the city, you might let all of your residents know. You might let all of your businesses know that there are solar garden options available to them, and that if you do that in a robust enough way, that that might count for a best practice. So that's what we're talking about in terms of that outreach. You want to let me hold that thing? It's not working. Okay. We're having technical difficulties. Just no, it is. tiny little ones, people on the phone. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how does it work? So this is these are um, lists of like really cheater versions of the model. Okay. So here's the co-op model. Very simple. The utility hosts and manages the garden. Right. So. Um, some of you, how many of you here in the room are familiar with the Wright Hennepin project? That was the first community solar. Okay. So Wright Hennepin, you can go out their back door. There is the garden. They actually host it and then they manage it. They manage that entire relationship with all of their co-op members who are then the subscribers. And they're the ones that manage the project with the developer, the developer doing it. So there was no relationship between the developer 
and the subscriber, all of it went through the co-op. Okay? So the, the utility in this instance is really that sort of the pivot point, right? There's a central entity around that. So Lake Region Co-op model is like that. Tri County project is like that. Candy Ohio Powers project is like that. All of the co-op models are following the same sort of thing. Okay. In the Excel Energy program, I would describe it as more of a triangle. Um, and different people have different sorts of relationships. So the utility is going to approve projects. They're going to track the production. They're going to provide the bill credit. The utility maintains its relationship with the subscribers. Right? So you're still a customer of Excel. You will get your credit on your bill from Excel. That is still the same relationship that you currently have. You also have a relationship with the garden operator. The operator is the, the entity that's going to keep the project up and running. They're going to manage the communication with you about how things are going on the garden. They're the ones with whom you will have a subscriber agreement. You'll have that sort of relationship management part with the operator for all of your questions about the solar garden. If you have questions about how it's working, you go to the operator. Is that part clear? Okay. The operator also has a relationship with Excel. So they have to follow all of the rules that Excel puts forward in terms of what makes a good project. They have to get all of their ducks in a row in terms of having the health site secured and following insurance requirements and all of that as part of their application. They have to go through interconnection. And they have to get that project approved by Excel to move forward. The garden operator then manages who has the subscriptions over time. And they let Excel know when someone is a subscriber. Then Excel will then start doing the credit based on their share of the output of the system. If they no longer are a customer of Excel, then the operator has to handle the transfer of that subscription to someone else. Can you get a subscriber uh, be, be the, uh, the operator? Can a subscriber be the operator? Yes. Um, in theory, yes. Um, I'm, I think in practice, perhaps uh, it's going to be a bit less common just because of all of the different pieces that the operator has to take on in terms of managing a project. It could happen, and one of the places where I think we might see more of that kind of thing happening is particularly around a municipal utility, where they, again, already sort of have that relationship with the local utility customer, as well as that sort of municipal operations role. Laura? One of the developers. Okay. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. One of the developers is proposing to the neighborhood groups, the nonprofits, that they will be the operator. Um, I, I mean, I think the thing to keep in mind is that these projects are going to be around for 20 or 25 years. And so someone has to play that role and manage all of the subscriptions and manage the solar system, make sure that it's up and running, that it's operational, all of the insurance requirements, and all of that for the entire lifetime of the project. And that's not a minor thing. I and mean, I just want to be clear, like the operator's role is really crucial to making sure that the project stays functional and that the benefits that people understood they were to get from the system are true to what was promised at the outset. There are a lot of folks, you know, one of the reasons that people are sort of excited about community solar gardens is it allows them to get into solar without having to like get into solar. Um, you know, they, they, can, they can have a subscription, and the people who know solar will manage the solar. They don't even have to put it on their own roof. You know, that sort of thing where people are like, that would be lovely. Someone else will take care of that. Now, it really speaks to what's your motivation for getting involved. And, and one of the things that we talk with a lot of people about is be clear about why you want to do this at the outset. So if one of the things that you want to do is really lower your energy bill, and that's why you're excited, I'm going to tell you, do energy efficiency. 
is what you want to do is be able to show everyone that you're doing solar. There are lots of different ways to do that. And it might be through doing a community solar garden and getting signs up or window decals or stuff on your website that shows we have participated as a subscriber in a garden. And that might be a way to do it. Or it might be putting solar on your own roof or that kind of thing. But it really gets down to sort of why your site is doing it in the first place. Are we be talking about costs? Are we going to be talking yeah, about costs? Cost to the subscriber? Cost to the subscriber. Yeah. I think that there are probably um, some friends from our development partners who would be happy to talk to you about costs. Um, I would say the clearest answer I can give you is that they vary. <laughs> um, and they vary based on the company that you're going with and how big their project is and what kind of financing they got and all of that. But I, I think that that would be a good thing in terms of question and answer. And okay. some questions we might, some questions we might defer to the panel might be more appropriate for the panel. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. Is there going to be an actual cost transfer between the subscriber and the developer? I mean, are, is the subscriber going to be paying the developer directly? Yes. Yeah. Um, the subscriber will be paying something to the operator directly. And let's go to the next slide. Okay. Sorry. No, sorry. Oh, and then this thing doesn't. Oh, too many things. I knew that was going to happen at some point. Okay. So, but Leah, good question. So, part of it is it depends on the sort of model that people are using. Um, when, when this was first, about a year ago, when people were first talking about community and solar gardens, one of the things that people were talking about was largely this model of pay up front. Okay? So what that means, this is this is Liz's version of PowerPoint. Don't tell Dan C that this is what it looks like. He's a communications person, and he would be like, oh my god, I can't believe you did that. Okay. So here's the basic of that, okay? It's one dollar bill, not hundred dollars bill. Okay, so you put the money in up front. Okay? The sun shines for 20 years. And every month on your utility bill, you get a credit for your share of the system's output. This money, Leah, to your specific question, is the subscriber's money, and the money goes to the developer or operator. That's where that transaction happens in the upfront model. Does that seem, I mean, is this a simple enough graphic that you're all like, okay, great, I get it. Okay. Okay, let's go to the, um, there we go. Okay, pay as you go. <laughs> so here, um, it's really more that you're paying, it could be a monthly basis, it, I mean, it could vary, but say it's monthly. Every month you would pay, again, the operator, you the subscriber would pay the operator, and then it would look like this for all months except for the very first month, is how I basically understand it. First month, you're going to put money in, and then you get credit the next month. Because they don't want to give you credit for a time when you weren't actually a subscriber. So very first month, say you put in your, say, $15. And you'll get a credit, so you put it in in December, and then you would get a credit in January. And then every month here forward, you would be paying the operator, and you'd be getting the credit from Excel. Okay? So it's not like you're not getting the money back from the operator. You're giving money to them. And all of those funds, in either model are the things that will be used for the operations and maintenance of the system, to getting it, you know, getting everything going, making sure that all of the ducks are in a row for handling all of the administrative costs, all of the insurance, yada, yada, yada. Okay, those are basically the two different models that people are using. There are also people who are doing combo models. So right Hennepin um, actually has a combination model where you can do some portion of pay up front and some portion of pay as you go. And so you have different options. That honestly is really about sort of what works for you in terms of how much money you want to put down up front and how much you want to pay over time. And if you want to put a little bit more down up front, maybe you don't have to pay as you go, or you don't want to put any down up front, and you pay as you go the whole time, or some combination thereof. Okay. Everybody good? I'd like to give me the knock. Okay. We're good. Okay. So, the question is, I think for a lot of cities, what role is it that you actually would like to play? I, I will say that perhaps the easiest role to play might be to just tell people, projects are up there. You can subscribe. And that is the megaphone. 
that's what the megaphone means, right? Okay, you can, you can help in terms of outreach. Now, it gets a little bit more tricky almost immediately after I say that's the easiest part, okay? Because what are you doing outreach about, right? So, you can't really, honestly, I don't think, as a city or a local government unit, just pick one project to do outreach about. Because then every other project that you didn't say anything about is going to be, um, at the very least, irritated with you. Okay, so that's something to think about. Um, you could just have a listing or a link to a site that has all sorts of different projects listed or that kind of thing. You could do educational sessions with people just to let them know about what community solar gardens are, how the concept works, what kinds of questions they should ask, that kind of thing. But that would be sort of the, probably the least amount of investment of your time and energy, just to do that outreach partner part. There may also be ways that you could then engage all sorts of people in your community, like your environmental commission like your community development people, and all sorts of others that you could get to help on that effort to engage more people in doing that. There are a number of cities, I mean, many of you may have even done this, done outreach around green pricing programs. How many of you? Yeah, okay. The one non-city up here in the front. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there are cities that have done that, that they've done a real push to get people to sign up for green pricing. I mean, this is akin to that, except that there are lots of other options and it's not just a subscription for people in Excel territory for one company, right? It's not just pointing them to utilities. Okay, another option might be to be a host site. Um, here, this is a picture of a bunch of third people on a tour standing on a roof, which totally they should not have done. But they did. Um, this is actually a hotel, but it would be, you know, this would be a sort of an example of, okay, say this was City Hall or an athletic facility or some place where you had big roof drawn structural <laughs> integrity, probably a newer roof that you're not feeling like you need to replace in the next couple of years, which is something to think about, um, with lots of access to sun and no trees planted right outside of the roof that may then grow up and shade it, okay? So it could be a whole site. It wouldn't have to be on a roof. It could be on a ball field, as Dr. gave an example earlier of a project that they've been thinking about. It could be in an open field. It could be um, near a wind turbine. Uh, it could be near the coke refinery. I mean, you know, there are lots of options. But it, it doesn't have to be on a roof, but you could be a host site. And you could be thinking about, do we have land or roof space that might be great, and we want to be able to have it on our own facility. That's the sort of host site option. Or it might be that you're a subscriber. Now, you, you're probably going to subscribe to more than David Schmidt here did. Um, this is at the right hand of dedication. He got a little yard sign. Um, he got one panel for it. <laughs> okay, so you know, this is like, you could do that much. You could do a lot more than that. I think one of the big questions for local governments right now is how do we go about becoming a subscriber and how do we pick which projects we want to subscribe to? And so there's much discussion, and I think Laura's going to talk about this a bit more, about how do we do an RFP, a request for proposal, that allows us to get lots of different bids from companies that say, here's what it would cost for you to be a subscriber to our project. Okay. There are lots of other roles, and I will just show you this briefly. I have about an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that we worked with a group of neighborhoods in Minneapolis. They brainstormed all of the roles that a neighborhood and or city community group might play. They had a lot of ideas about all of the different things that you could do. And honestly, I think, the key point in that is that you could do nearly anything, but you need to make sure that you're going about it in the way that you need to with your procurement rules and making sure that you're doing things in the sort of public, transparent way that you need to do it as a local unit of government. Okay. There. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This is sort of how I feel every morning when I wake up. <laughs> um, we, we're trying. We're trying to answer a lot of those questions. We're really trying. And we're trying to hear what your questions are and actually then write them down and get people who are smarter than we are to tell us the answers so we can post that too. Um, we have a really long, frequently asked questions document on our website. But we have everything from like, how do you do the developer? What makes it a website? Uh, can I hope that I use the energy that's generated on this roof? You know, there are all these little permutations of questions. And I think one of the most important things to do as you're thinking about community solar gardens is to start talking to each other. 
because you're not the first one to have thought of this. <laughs> as insulting as that may sound, I didn't mean it that way. But lots of other people are also thinking about this, and there are lots of other examples out there, and part of it is really about interacting with each other and getting some ideas. So, I'm going to give you this. When the webinar people do stuff and I need to type, it switches the control from the top one. Okay, um, current projects. This is um, a recap of all of them. So you guys get a sense that all of these top six, I think, now, um, are co-op projects. Um, and you can subscribe to those as well. I mean, if you're a co-op customer, you can subscribe, right? So I didn't say that at the beginning. I probably should have at some point. If you are a customer of the utility who has a project, you can subscribe. So if you are not a customer of Wright Hennepin, you cannot subscribe to Wright Hennepin projects. If you're not a customer within Excel territory, you cannot subscribe to the projects that are within Excel territory. If you move out of Excel territory, you have to give your subscription back or transfer the ownership in some form or fashion. If you move within Excel territory or within any of these co-op territories, you can keep your subscription and take it to your next dwelling, wherever that is. As long as you have a utility bill, you can be a subscriber. So these are all the different projects. Um, I believe that the Connexus project is probably the largest cooperative project. Um, right now, Right Hennepin was the first. They've had several different rounds of additional projects that they've added on. Um, we are trying to help do outreach about all of these all over the place. And here was a big update, and Diana said this at the very beginning. We have been linking to all of the TUC filings, because who doesn't love a good TUC filing? Um, <laughs> oh, okay, one person that doesn't love it. Uh, the rest of you, I am so delighted to hear that you do. But we would get questions all the time. Can you point us to that TUC filing? I was like, oh, God. Sure, it's like 120 pages long, go for it. Um, but we've been pointing to that. But now that the program is live, there will be lots of other ways to get more information about it. And, and Holly's going to talk a little bit about the rates and some of the other things. But the, the program began accepting applications on Friday at 9 a.m. And I, and I hear that there have been several applications already. Just a few. Just, just you know, many, many, many. Um, so they're, they're all in the market. All right, next one. What's WC? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, because we're really self-absorbed, we always know the CERT region that something is in. <laughs> um, and I don't know what other regions people use. I don't know why you would use any other nomenclature for a region. But West Central is WC. SE is Southeast. Okay. <laughs> you know, we partner, and, and so we decide that our map is best. But other people have not used our map, so we, we're going to just own that. Um, so there are lots of different projects that are in the work. I mean, this, I, I'm mostly putting up a visual for you here to get a sense for that. There are lots of different people thinking about projects. I believe that Northfield, um, they've been working on a project with their group and actually did their big um, celebratory celebration last Thursday night, where they have signed on, actually, with Minnesota Community Solar to move their project forward. They're looking at a big project. This is a bunch of folks from Northfield, and um, Beth Lutheran has a project. I know that Oakville has been looking at Linden Hills Power and Light, um, a group from Winona. The Northern Sun was the first project that everybody heard about. There are lots of projects all over. There are a lot of people talking about, I think it's Highway 212, being sort of the new solar garden alley or something. I mean, uh, there, there are lots of projects under development. And if you're wondering if there is one near you, or one that you can subscribe to, because you can subscribe to one within your own county, or any of the adjacent counties, I am guessing the answer to that question is yes. Now, Shannon, for you up in Crookton, Maybe not yet, but I think that there are things in development. And I know that a lot of utilities that don't have anything now are also waiting and watching how a sales program goes to think about sort of what might they do. And that doesn't mean that they will do anything, but a lot of people are taking that information in. And there's not yes. quite, uh, the enabling legislation allows any utility to create a structure for a program. So the question was, um, utilities are not required, but the enabling legislation allows utilities to create programs, and the answer is yes and yes. Excel was the only utility that was required to go through the solar garden process, but all other utilities can also do that, as many of the co-ops have demonstrated. So, um, so Northern Sun, where's that place? Northern Sun is on Lake Street. It's a commercial business. Mm -hmm. They have really cute bumper stickers. Okay. 
Um, and then just to sort of wrap up on our end, Holly's going to talk a bit more about some of these documents that we've been in the process of developing um, with a number of partners, including Department of Commerce and NINSEA and MRES, some subscriber and operator disclosure documents that would help you sort of make sure that you're getting what you need to out of the subscriber agreement, questions that you should ask as a subscriber, and then even questions that a community might ask sort of on behalf of its many members to an operator or developer about going into a project. And then one last thing. Um, I can't remember. The roof? No, it's me. It was you. So one of the things that I just want to put out there is if you, as a local unit of government, are feeling like, oh my god, no, we have the best site, we have the best site, it's the greatest site, um, I would encourage you to take a look at the Solar Map app. Um, it's solarmap.uofm.edu slash app. You can load this up on your computer, and it allows you to actually enter an address. I do my, my home, 2024 Emerson Avenue South, and it will actually put a little dot right on my roof. This gives you a sense of the solar installation, so how much solar resource is hitting on every square meter in the state. Could be roof, could be ground. They've been doing some updates to the map. Um, like there had been a problem, I believe, with Stearns County and maybe Mille Lacs County, but they're going through and updating all of the data. It's a good place to start in terms of thinking about, is that really a good site? What would that look like? That kind of thing, because it does take into account shading. And um, with that, I think it is time for me to turn it over. Sorry, that was really, really, uh, people are coming at it from different angles, which is hard they might be paying attention to, because it's kind of, I call it the issue du jour, and what's the word in French for year, not day? <laughs> Because this is, it's been all about community solar. So, um, very exciting. Thanks so much. Um, very excited to have uh, in partnership, um, if you don't know, um, uh, the Division of Energy Resources Department of Commerce is one of the CERT's partners, one of the five. And uh, so we work really, really closely together with the department and really appreciate the relationship that we have. And um, it's very fortunate that we have Holly here who has become quickly an expert on um, things that you should ask. Yeah, see? We're exact opposite side way. Also, for those who don't know, a little trivia, Holly works for CERT um, way in the way back. What year was it? 2007. 2007. 2007. That was when I first came on. So um, we're excited to have Holly here. She's going to share some more information. <clears throat> Her bio is up there. I'm not going to read it. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Holly. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Diana. Uh, Linda covered a lot of ground there, some points I'll hit again just to reemphasize, um, others I'll, I'll bypass, but um, I'm with the Minnesota Department of Commerce, the Division of Energy Resources. We wear a lot of different hats helping communities around the state on renewable energy projects, but in my role, uh, we represent the public interest before the Public Utilities Commission on utility resource plans, rate cases, and since uh, 2013, I've been focused a lot on the human solar programs that Excel filed in September 2013 and now has launched uh, last week. So uh, I'm going to hit a few of the main points, but I think it's important to note that this is three four gardener programs in Excel service territory is one of many things that happened in the 2013 legislative session around solar energy. That's probably why you're seeing it in the newspaper you know, every day now, that filing this legislation is resulting in actual projects. So there's the 1.5% solar energy standards for investor-owned utilities. That means by the year 2020, they need to procure enough solar energy to meet 1.5% of the retail energy sales. And community solar is going to help utilities meet those requirements. Uh, we worked also on the value of solar tariffs, that some of you may have heard about. This is a methodology of how should utilities value solar energy that customers like yourself may be generating in their system. So there's that methodology out there. Um, Excel Solar Rewards 2.0, we like to call it, of the, the new incentive program based on the production of solar for small systems in the 20 kW. And then there's the, the state made in Minnesota incentive for systems under 40 kW. These are the small, the applicable to smaller community solar gardens as well. And then obviously community solar gardens. As Lisa said, 
um, the enabling legislation says that this can happen all over the state and sort of the first statewide uh, legislation in the whole country. And the important part is that it's, it's not a capped program. In other states that have started these programs, they have put a limit on how many gardens they can see per period annually in time period. And the legislation specifically says on caps is probably why we see such a large response. I like triangles as well. <laughs> I had an earlier triangle version, then I thought Excel has this, so I, I stole it from you guys because I thought it was a better one. But it's important to realize that a lot of you may understand this net metering that you may have if you have floor panels on your roof where you have the meter spins one way and you use more energy than you're producing, and it spins the other way, and you're producing more energy than you're consuming. We'll have a more in the summer, less in the winter, and you just pay for the net amount of kilowatt hours that you consume. This is not net metering. You're still going to pay for all the energy your facilities are consuming. And that's going to be in the rates on your bill that are governed by the PUC. PUC also will govern the rates that you'll get for the community solar guard and credits that you're producing. But you're going to get your bill in dollars and then your credit in dollars, and you'll pay the net amount of dollars. Not netting in kilowatt hour anymore, netting on dollars. So um, I believe in a seller website has some good descriptions and some graphics of what that bill may look like. Maybe John can speak more to that. But that's a key concept that sometimes people get confused because they're very familiar with net metering. And this is it's similar, but for many dollars, not kilowatt hours. As a regulator, and I can say that with pride, um, the Public Utilities Commission has jurisdiction on the utility and developer slash operator relationship. They also have jurisdiction on that utility and customer relationship, but that third part of the triangle, the customer and developer, which gets into your subscription prices, the terms of your contract, that is not those parts that are governed by the PUC, but the majority of unregulated markets. So you need to understand what you're signing up for um, because it's not something that the Public Utilities Commission is going to focus their for energy on um, unless there's significant complaints that may go over to the Attorney General's office side. So you just need to understand that the, the prices of your subscription, the terms of their contract, are not regulated. You, as a buyer of a potential subscription, need to do your homework. People always want to know why they're going to get paid for their subscriptions. This is the way the bill credits that you'll see on this is for Excel Energy Program. If you're an Excel customer as a subscriber, you are going to get one of these nine rates that you find out today. So it's the, instead of the applicable retail rate, and then depending on the size of the garden, and then if the garden developer has chosen to sell the renewable energy credits, that's the related to the solar energy generation, then you'll get um, one of the bottom two rows, which is still calling the enhanced rate. So these are going to be updated every year. So come March, we'll get a new table on here uh, with the 2015 numbers. But if you were to sign up with a solar garden today, you would get the Apple retail rate, which is going to be updated annually for up to 25 years. And I believe in the third handout, you have to be able to reproduce. So you don't have to dig into the PUC regular term firing. You can find it in a much prettier format. There's a lot of nuances to the program. And let's just hit on the main points, but I'm not going to repeat them. But I want to emphasize the contract relationships you have with the developer and the utility and the subscriber are very important. You just need to have a fundamental understanding of who you're doing business with and, and where. So there are different developer models out there, the pay-as-you-go, the upfront payment, combinations of them. You need to understand the relationship that you're having to end. And do your homework, do your due diligence. How long has the developer been in business? What other gardens do they have? Do they have um, references that you can contact? Those are all important questions. The solar garden 
per the PUC rules, um, are going to last 25 years. That's how long Excel and developer have a contract. Your description could last up to 25 years. That's the terms of the contract you need to figure out with your developer and operator. I use those terms interchangeably, but I probably should use the operator to be more uh, efficient. But up to 25 years, do your evaluation. Luckily, with cities and counties, we think you're going to stay in business for 25 years, and you may have more comfort levels than others who may move out of Excel to service territory to, to find out for a whole 25 year contract. Um, that's unique to cities and counties. As a renter, I move around quite a bit, so I, you know, this program is way designed for renters or people who can't put full on the room. So you have to think about uh, the transferability of your subscription if you want to get terminate that agreement with your developer, what are some of those clauses you get out of it? Um, and think about as a, a county city with your same power, maybe that can command a better price. I'm going to say it out there. I'm a regulator and not in the consumer protection area, but you have some power, you're a large entity, you're in credit, trustworthy one. Think about that as you're evaluating. Your subscription can be up to 120% of your average annual energy usage. And then you can't be more than 40% of one garden. So think about what are you getting in the community solar? Is it to offset most of your energy bill? Is it for public relations? You want to think about that as you size your subscription. It may not be wise to go all 120%. Probably not why it's much fun. It's wonder why it's not worth the time. So you want to think about what are your goals and, and how much you can invest in this now. Or as a page you go model, that will factor to how much you can invest. Part of the 120% rule is you need to know what is your average annual energy usage. And for some larger city and county, that's not an easy question because you might have hundreds of accounts. So you want to work with your utility account manager to get that data, but it's also maybe a good opportunity to get more familiar with your utility bills. What buildings are you using more energy? What um, accounts do you want to credit my subscription to make it easier on your end? So know who's handling your bills. They're a very important person, and my experience has been in working with some communities that kind of overlooked and Making that more available electronically, getting that data is very powerful, and you'll need it for this. Part of the 120 pages of the Public Utilities Commission's order on this topic is a subscriber disclosure uh, protection requirement. Um, there's a bullet list of all the disclosure items that operators need to disclose to use the potential subscriber. So has put this in a nice checklist on the left side here, and it continues on to the next page. Um, so that way, it can be a tool for you that going into the PUC order, looking at what are the required elements, checking out what page on the subscription um, agreement is that covered. You can walk through that with the subscription develop offer operator to know what you're getting into. The disclosures cover a lot of ground, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions that uh, as service has worked with folks and the program has worked with potential subscribers that people have. So the, the subscriber questions document on the right, I believe, will be available on CERN's website. And it covers other things you should know of before you're subscribing. Get more familiar with the rates um, and some of the other terms that are defined by the Public Utilities Commission and some that are not that you'll need to evaluate. You're not alone in this. Um, there are other governments that have gone down this route, whether they're subscribers or um, home sites. You know, subscriptions may not be the only role you can play. Maybe you could be offering an RFP for developers who want to use your land as a home site. Another opportunity. Excel Energy also operates the Community Solar Ground Program in parts of Colorado, and these are just some of the uh, government entities that have subscription agreements through that program with their free developers. 
So if you're looking, if you're going to do a request for proposals to get subscription prices from developers in terms of contracts, perhaps you want to reach out to these uh, entities to see, kind of borrow your RFP, kind of see how you frame these questions. There are some key differences with the Colorado program, so you want to know that. But uh, there's a lot of work done here. Locally, I know that uh, the St. Paul Public Housing Agency has put out an RFP for subscriptions that can be for are part of their energy usage. Um, so I, we have copies of that RFP. Um, they're happy to share if you want to use that to start building your own RFP process. And again, you need to work with your own procurement process to understand the RFP's right tool or not. These contracts could last up to 25 years. So my understanding is a lot of cities and counties do have restrictions on a contract for more than five years. So you may need to look at what variants um, you may need from that, how to pursue that. Um, you may be more better at economy to scale one time to have a greater long time five years. And with that, maybe if there's any immediate questions, I'm happy to answer but I'll fall beyond the panel. Um, and I have all the PC orders in the binder. So if there's any specific questions, we can pull it out. But uh, I, please don't. <laughs> Are there any, any economic uh, incentives? I didn't your charging the computer to indicate that if there's any money is not an issue, then this has got to be some other reason to, to subscribe to solar. Okay. The business models that the developers are offering. That's where you need to figure out if you're, there's what the cost savings potential is for you as a subscriber. So the rates of your bill credit and that table, those are defined and regulated. But the business model, so it's up front or pay as you go, you can do a return on investment calculation over the term of that contract to see what would I be saving under these assumptions. One of the key assumptions you need to make is what do I think is going to happen to my <coughs> electricity prices I pay. And that's, we have some data on the historical averages of the last 20 years or so, but that you know, no one can really predict that process. So if you want to look at when developers are offering you this payback period and they're making these assumptions of electricity prices, you will begin asking questions on, on how they develop that forecast. We have a question from uh, mine. Um, and then Flynn asks, how would community solar gardens potentially benefit from smart grid technology that allows for real-time pricing of energy? So again, your, the prices you pay for your electricity you consume are going to be separate than the prices you're getting paid in your bill credit. So if you, if there is a time of day rate, your utility service charge already. That's going to show up on the bill of how much you're going to pay. But at least in Excel's program, the rates are static for the year by customer class. So that, that's, a, again, it's important to realize those are two separate rate streams. And right now, we have no time of day rate for solar. Um, if you want to learn more about some options around that, that topic is addressed in this value of solar methodology that the Department of Commerce did develop. On you know, solar applies a lot of on peak power, and when it's really hot in July and August, and there's an economic benefit to that. Um, and that methodology tends to quantify that. That's not um, directly reflected in the current rate. Do you mind writing it down for the panel? Sorry. We want to get Laura up here before we start the panel. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Holly. Um, so now um, we're lucky to have our friend and partner, Laura Burrington from the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. We collaborate a lot, and it's really wonderful. Not every state has the relationships that we do, and it makes our work, I think, in Minnesota just go that much better. So happy to have Laura here. Um, her uh, bio is up here. Um, she's going to cover some of the work that MRES is, done, is just doing. And some of that started with a seed grant way back then from us. It's true. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for being here. Laura, thank you. Oh, wait. 
One more thing. I forgot to tweet. I, it's on your agenda, but the hashtag green step shop without follows. So if you're tweeting or doing anything, I'm, 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 doing, I'm tweeting up here. Thanks. Okay. All right. So I'm Laura Burrington. Um, now I've got to forget to do many things, but I am. Okay. I can you want to click for me? Click for you. Okay. So uh, I'm Laura Burrington with the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. Uh, we're a nonprofit that works to promote education, advocacy, and awareness um, to grow renewable energy in Minnesota. So um, let's see. So we got involved in Community Solar because we were recently granted a renewable development fund project to do two community solar gardens, two 500 kilowatt community solar gardens, one in an urban area, one in a rural area in Excel Energy Territory. So what we're hoping to accomplish with this project um, is kind of to compare and contrast if people really want their community solar garden in their community, or maybe they just want the credit on their utility bill. So that will be one of the things we'll be looking at. And then we are also hoping that as a nonprofit, I'm working to develop two gardens, um, find sites, work with the developer, work with outreach partners, that we'll be able to, to look at the best practices figure out what we saw as opportunities for this field to grow, what we saw as barriers or problems that could be addressed, um, publish our lessons learned at the end of this grant, and um, hopefully come out with some model documents uh, that will help home sites um, have a better project and um, kind of do those model documents more in layman's terms with maybe things to consider while you're looking at these legal contracts. So, um, what's the next one? That's me, by the way. <laughs> looking at sites. <laughs> Solar goes here. Next, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go over these three roles in more detail. And um, I, I think a city or county government entity could be all three of these. They could be a combination of two, or they could be just one. So I'm going to kind of go over these in a little bit more detail, maybe not so much the subscriber roles, but what we hope to do from our project is to get these model documents out to these people. So um, for these roles, the whole site might need a roof lease or a land lease with the developer. Um, the outreach partners should probably have some kind of agreement with the developer. Uh, as to how their roles will go, what may be the compensation. And then, of course, the subscribers will need some kind of, I would hope, some kind of guidelines for subscribers. And I think that's what SIRS is developing, so like what you should look for in your contract, what you should look for saying on a dotted line. All right, next slide. So, uh, so best practices, what we really want to see here is um, transparency, and consumer protection. Um, that's at least from our side, and I'm sure developers are going to have best practices, and we're going to try to work on that too, but at this point, we're kind of trying to work on the consumer protection part. Next slide. So some considerations for best practices for land or roof, if you want to be a whole site, um, are, well, the length is a term. So if you're looking to Lease space, you should recognize that at least in Excel Energy Territory, that will be 25 years. Cooperative territories, we've been hearing anywhere from 20 to 40 years. Some um, developers in Colorado are looking at leasing land for 40 years. So that's something to consider. Um, compensation should, of course, be considered. People are looking at monthly payments, yearly payments, or a payment in a form of a subscription or the percentage of the energy produced from that system. And that is um, what I've heard from other states is about 5% of the energy produced, maybe 3 to 5%. So if you want to do the math on that with the rate that Holly gave you and then the size that your system would be, you could figure out a rough estimate for that. Um, other things to consider would be um, having a maintenance clause in your contract, uh, use and access to make sure both you as a host site and the developer have use and access to the site, 
that you're both comfortable with. Um, you should be talking to the developer about insurance, who's covering what, making sure that this project is going to be safe for the next 25 years. Um, and then there's the end of the 25 years. What happens then? Who's responsible for equipment removal? Um, what about site restoration? We make sure that the site is returned to you in the same condition that you got it. Be nice. Uh, let's see. What's other conditions? So in the next slide, for specifically for Brook Mountain Solar as a host site, um, you'll want to talk to your developer about whether they're using um, solar that penetrates the roof or doesn't penetrate the roof. There are both kinds. Um, I get asked a lot about size. So I just give an estimate here for one megawatt. That's the largest community solar garden can be under Excel Energy um, law or the legislation for Excel Energy Territory. So what we're seeing is that most developers do want to take advantage of economies of scale and um, install the largest garden that they can. So it's one megawatt, but of course I think that they will be willing to work with cities that have a smaller roof. And just keep in mind that most roofs aren't uninterrupted. So you want to keep that this 150,000 square feet is for uninterrupted, so it might be more than that. Um, you'll of course want to talk, think about roof replacement. Uh, moving a solar system for repairs um, may be one thing, but moving the entire system to replace the entire roof would probably not be good. So you'll want to get your roof replaced ahead of time. Um, and then you'll want to talk with your installer or your developer about protecting your building. So you'll want to find out if that's a penetrating system. Will that violate your roof warranty on your new roof you just got? So that will be something to think about. And of course, you want to make sure that any damage done during installation will be covered by the developer. So make sure that's in the contract. Next. So here's the, the size for a one megawatt roughly brown mountain system. It's about eight acres. That is the space in the yellow um, line there to get an idea of what that looks like aerially. Um, you'll want to be thinking about the zoning code for a ground installation like this. And um, CERT has access to um, a national grant right now. Um, people that are working on that that can help you guys with the zoning code work. So you've probably heard from Brian Ross at Sierra Planning about that. So he um, is currently working on a project that can help um, cities and counties with the zoning work. So what else about land mount? Yeah, I mean, you just want to make sure you're not going to be held responsible to do site preparation. That should all be the developer and then the site restoration at the end. That should all be the developer. Um, and then we really want everyone to think about using um, the land in a smart way. First, we want to look at land that is either a brownfield or wastewater treatment plant, um, areas that we know are not going to be developed in the next 25 years, not used for food, not used for parks. Um, that will be the, the best and smartest way that we can go about this and the best practice to look at that space first. <coughs> So for partnerships, um, the other partnership can be an outreach partner. What I have about that. So um, we are going to hopefully try developing some agreements, model agreements, as to what these outreach partnerships can look like. And, and like um, Lisa said, we've talked with neighborhood groups. They have a whole list of possibilities. So it's kind of endless. <laughs> So we want to make sure that we can um, bring up ways that you guys can partner in a smart way that benefits you and benefits the developer. And this will kind of be part of the negotiation that you guys will be doing with the developer. So what are you guys looking for? Um, what are some issues that you can trade off with the developer? And um, you know, just smart negotiations to make sure everybody gets a good deal. So one of those ideas is if you're going to host or be an outreach partner for a garden, do you want to make sure that your constituents get first dibs 
on that garden. Or maybe you want um, to trade your whole site payment for a low income discount for your constituents. So there's lots of ideas as to how this can really work well for a city and you guys can market yourself as well as the developer. Um, and then the, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but you can also talk about cash payments versus a subscription for the city. And another, uh, one other thing to think about for that is that some systems produce more um, energy for the same amount of space as other systems. It depends on the equipment they use. So to be a smart consumer, you want to make sure that um, you know, you want to look for the a bigger amount of energy produced for your bang for your buck. So let's see, make sure I got it right. I think the first time I've given a pre I usually give a list of presentations. <laughs> uh -huh. So all right, uh, let's see what's next. So our goal for this project on the next slide is transparency. It's all very new to Minnesota. Um, the businesses that are involved, some are coming up from Colorado, but some of the businesses are new to this too. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're communicating everything that we're learning with the consumers and the host sites and the marketing partners, and that everybody has a very clear, transparent relationship with the developers. So um, we can make sure that the silver industry you know, gets a great reputation. The community solar is successful in Minnesota, so other states will pick it up and take it. So we want to make sure it's all, um, everybody's happy. And we don't have to go to the Attorney General. That's what we're all hoping for. So I think that's it. This is my contact information on the next slide. So we'll move on to panel and questions. Unless there's any clarifications or any specifics for Laura about what she talked about really quick, as we, uh, we need to take a question. It's we have to kind of set up the panel. So Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, just jumping back to um, utilities statewide that are required to offer green power pricing, so with a uh, wind source program, for example. Mm -hmm. So in, for example, in cities or in neighborhood groups that have been promoting, encouraging people to, you know, sign up for wind source. How would you contrast the two? What's the, what's the message the city needs to give? If it's giving a message about consider um, if you're not free right. your system on your own. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and pricing also the sort of pricing. Yeah. What I like to say about community solar versus wind source is that community solar really does live up to its name and it is, it is in your community. It's within a contiguous county. Wind source, they can really uh, from what I understand, what how they sort of work to me, but I believe they can purchase those wrecks really from anywhere, and maybe they might be building wind in southern Minnesota, but I, what, I, what I believe they may not, they might just be purchasing them somewhere else. So if you want to keep your energy within your community, within your state, keep the job local, um, that's why I would encourage community solar in that front. And then, you know, I have wind source, and it's not clear to me on my utility bill. And I think this community solar could really be a clear, um, you know, return on investment. Can I can I have one? Yeah, you know. We, one, one difference, though, is that with green pricing, the green pricing that you're buying into is over and above any requirements that you, utility has to do renewable energy. And community solar can be a way that the utility reaches reaches its requirements. So those are the slight differences to keep in mind. Um, and as a subscriber, if if the operator that you're working with sells the rack, I mean then the utility has those racks and you you don't, I guess is the very simplest way to, to convey that. And you have to tell them that well. Okay. All of that and this is right, the wind source renewable energy credit, those are so that these recs we're talking about represent the renewableness, the, the new carbonness of the wind and solar energy. And for our renewable energy standards and solar energy standard compliance, 
stem cell has to hold up cattle be correct, person can be correct, because they can come from anywhere in the mid continent in the kind of system operator area or mine cell, and that's multiple states. So if you're concerned that your goal is community uh, locally generated energy, this program has no benefit for that. But you know, the other program has to all right. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, we're going to kick off the yeah, we've got some more. <laughs> oh, it's because you were all sitting down. Um, we did this quick change reel for you on the phone. And while we were answering that question, brought assembled uh, the power panel, sun power panel. Um, in front of us and our um, everyone else you heard from earlier in order with uh, Holly and Laura and then um, John Wold um, and Joy Dutch-Mexile Energy who has been since pre-launch of the Minnesota Solar Rewards Program the manager for that program we work with them a lot um, actually that picture is from when you met with us in our office <laughs> I was like I have a picture of John Wold um, so thank you, welcome to the panel. Um, we are very excited to have, I think, some really good um, resources for information. They might not be able to answer every question, but um, I think between um, these folks, if they don't know, they'll probably have a sense of where to get the information. Um, and if there are questions that are unanswered, we will try to get that and get that out to folks that were here, because um, we know that um, this is a new topic area, and so folks are really interested in finding answers to questions. So um, this is really open. We really wanted to have a broader discussion, question and answer. Um, I have one question that was asked earlier from uh, somebody online that I thought I'd start with, for me up. Um, and then I didn't bring any prepared questions, which is like the worst rule in facilitators. Like that is the, but I was guessing this group was going to have enough questions that I would have had to popcorn them in. So, um, I'm going to start with this question and then we'll open it up. Uh, the question is, there are significant application fees and deposits required by utilities as well as specific ongoing annual fees for community solar projects. See outline the requirements of Excel and any other regional utility. And that's from Brent on the phone. I don't know who, is that you, Holly? I can, can, but John. John, you want to start with that one? <coughs> you can talk about oh, Excel. Oh, You'll look him up. He's got a he's got a glossary here. Um, there, the, there's one microphone there. Oh, there's two. Perfect. Because they're not rows. Uh, as filed, there. If you want to be a garden developer, there's a twelve hundred dollar application fee per garden, and there is a three hundred dollar participation fee per year to facilitate the garden functions of maintain subscribers and other features. And then there is a $100 per KW um, deposit, but that's refundable. And that's just to ensure that um, the projects that we receive are in good faith and they actually tend to move forward with them. And it's refundable regardless of the garden goes forward or not. And, then, and, and I just want to say back to that point you just made about project coming forward, I know that in the solar rewards program in the past, one issue had been that there were a lot of projects in the queue that maybe weren't super realistic, and it really kind of bogged down the queue for projects that were trying to go through that approval process. So is that part of the reasoning behind having a higher application fee or a deposit? Yeah, that's basically it. Okay. And then there's just the regular, once you build a garden, you're, you become an Excel Energy customer. And there would be some minor um, metering charges that you would have to maintain every month. I'm going to add that all those are for the, the operator side. So if you are a subscriber, you're not paying those directly. It's probably reflected in your subscription price. But those are all the requirements on the operators who are developing and or operating the gardens, and, and they're familiar with them all. Other questions? None? Okay. Thanks so much. Oh. I'm sorry, Do you have a microphone? No. I was going to be still down in here. I'm kind of losing my voice. But um, 
I was wondering I if I'm Mia with Henry County, and I was wondering if you had set that parameter of 120 percent of your average energy use, and over the next 25 years, you reduce your energy use by either eliminating buildings or doing energy efficiency. Does that still 120 percent apply, and it's continually updated over the years, or you just get to go with whatever your subscription time is? Very good question and um, came up early on in the process. The statute is where the statute enabling this has 120 percent language in there, but the Public Utility Commission further refines that that will be checked when you sign up for your subscription and then if your usage varies after that, you're not going to keep checking it in. You have to be in compliance when you sign the subscription date, but as you point out, it may be, if it had to check it annually, it would be disincentive to conserve. Um, the only caveat to that is if you uh, purchase more subscriptions or change your subscription size, you can trigger a 120% compliance check. Or if you change residences, we'll say for residential, but if you change your address, um, Excel is going to check the 120% at your new location, uh, likely using estimated data based on square footage and type of facility because you don't have historic average energy data at your new facility since you just moved there. Those are the two um, notes on that. But if you're in your, your city hall, your county building, you're not moving, um, you've got to comply with the beginning and then it will be more compliant. Other questions? So to follow up, Mary DeCotch from Ramsey County, um, what happens if you fall out of compliance? The, the details on that are being worked out in a working group right now. Um, basically, my understanding of the discussion state is, let's say you're now at 125 percent after you move. Um, that five percent is out of compliance, so you would not get credit for that five percent that's above your 120 percent compliance. But um, the details on that are being worked out, and I believe there's a should back up. There's a working group of both Excel. Energy Department of Commerce and many of the developers operating the space that the Public Utilities Commission told us. Keep working on all these details that you're finding as the program rolls out. So we're actually meeting about that topic this afternoon. Um, but if the portion is out of compliance, um, you wouldn't be able to get credit for. So you want to look at your subscriber agreements. So if that happens, how can I can I transfer that back to the developer? Can I sell it to a third party? You want to see those transferability terms as you're evaluating contracts. And I guess that was going to be a follow-up question. Does the developer then, are they responsible for selling that additional capacity if you're doing a lot of energy efficiency and you've gone out of compliance? Or I guess it's something that's negotiable up front. I don't need to dominate here, but this is a topic. Oh, you. I don't want to talk about it. So again, if you're in the same building and you do all this energy efficiency, the Excel Energy developer is not going to check you annually for 120%. It's only going to trigger that if you really will change your subscription size, you decide to buy more, or sell them off, or if you move your location. And that's the um, you know, trouble you spot, honestly, from my perspective, because it creates more uncertainty. Um, again, the, the point to the decision doesn't regulate the, your contracts with the developers, so you want to look for that in your contract <coughs> if I'm out of compliance because my location has changed, I've changed my subscription size, what, ha what, what happens to my unfortunate out of compliance? Uh, can I sell it back to you? Can I sell it somebody else? You need to look at that as your evaluating contract. And, and honestly, whether or not you go that the compliance thing is an issue. Any subscriber should look in their subscriber agreement to understand what the transferability 
requirements are. Do I mean what is that price at which they purchase it back from you? Do they purchase it back? Do you need to find another subscriber to take that place? Do they find I mean those are the you want to look at the details of what that subscriber agreement says with regard to transferability. It will vary based on which operator you're working with. And as long as you're comfortable with what it says, then, then you're fine. But you should just know what it says. From the web, we have uh, from Michael Russell. Um, it seems like the 120% estimate, so um, for estimating issues, um, should be made over several past years given the fact of whether it's this the case. I can talk to John. What do you want to share? What was that call? It was about um, for estimating the average use of energy, so to know like if they're going to be 120 percent or less. Um, that this estimate should be made over several past years, given the effects of weather. Is this the case? <clears throat> yeah, it's all the rewards we take the past 12 months. For solar rewards, we take the past 12 months. So for some reason, when the legislation was written or became, was the average of the past 24 months. So we, in the system, do typically have that. If, if there isn't 24 months, there is a process, a step-down process to calculate it just like we do with solar rewards. <coughs> Oh, yeah, right. Um, uh, Philip Music, a question about subscriber agreements and changing technology. I'm assuming that the pricing, and then maybe it's depending on whether it's a lump sum or, or monthly payments for 25 years, I'm assuming the subscriber agreements are going to say something about changing technology. So if I buy into panels that are at the X efficiency now, in 15 years, if there are panels out there that are three times or four times as efficient, Am I, I'm, it's sort of like the fear of being stuck with the ESO, you know, I bought, you know, I bought tra trailing edge technology and now I'm paying more than I sort of should. Are, are sort of developers, installers thinking about this? Are subscription agreements reflecting what might happen at year 20? Uh, I think you absolutely should look at that in your <laughs> subscriber agreement. And um, yes, I think people who are putting systems up are very cognizant that the technology is changing. But how they address that in a subscriber agreement, again, will vary. So if that's one of your concerns, like I'm nervous about locking myself into a technology that may be not as great in 15 years, well, what, what does that tell me? Well, one, it tells me that I want to make sure that the project that I'm subscribing to that there's easy accessibility and that it could, you know, that they could change it out or that kind of thing. But those are the questions that you want to ask of an operator and the details that you want to have clarified as you go to subscribe. So if I were a local government, that would be one of those questions that you might want to address in your RFP. How will you address changes in technology? Is there, you know, potential that these might be upgraded 15 years down the road? What does that mean in terms of my cost? I think those are the sorts of questions that you want to answer. I would just add that uh, garden operators are required to disclose to you their production projections that they are assuming is part of your subscription terms and pricing. That's part of the disclosure checklist that certain have on the website. 25 years. So for Excel, the energy service charge already has the 25 year projection. So based on the technology that of the panels in place. They have to make assumptions on the production and the methodology used for that, and that they have to disclose that to you. Jim. Jim Evil with the City of St. Paul. Um, I guess the, the question I hear most from subscribers is what if anything is in place for protection against them or for them if a developer or operator goes out of business? <laughs> so there's a lot of things that they have to disclose that are in that checklist. I will say also the question of whether or not these could be considered securities under security law, which are buying an upfront investment. Um, 
that question has come up. In the Department of Commerce, we have a security uh, group that statewide regulation of Minnesota securities, and while well, researching that, but that would be something you, know, you need to look at. If you go out of business, where am I in the line of creditors uh, to get paid out? Uh, what, and you want to do your due diligence on, let me see if I get a good standing with the, with the state. Let me see the other certifications. If gardens have to have insurance, to what extent does that insurance cover subscribers for under production of panels, for going out of business, look at the, the terms of the insurance. Um, I, I can say that the Department of Commerce is we're looking at this on consumer protection. I'm a utilities analyst, but I'm working with our consumer protection folks on this, and we hope to get uh, more information out there this spring about the security questions related to these. <laughs> I just have a follow-up to that. Um, is the in terms of the insurance is that one of the things that's uh, required by developer operators to disclose to potential subscribers? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I was also going to say that um, I'm not sure if this is on the checklist with the operations and maintenance fund. That, that's also on the checklist. So all these operators, the best practice for the developers is to establish an operations and maintenance fund for the, that, that will cover 25 years of subscription management. So that will, uh, you know, replace the murders if they get um, go down. And I would think that hopefully even if the business goes out of business, the operations and maintenance fund will cover that still account. So, that's another thing to look for in your This is a follow-up from um, Michael Russell um, about the estimates. Um, so to John, um, Holly Ladd has said that estimating the average energy use in a municipality can be difficult if there are many accounts. As we move ahead in developing renewable energy in our St. Paul neighborhood, we want to establish a baseline of energy use preferably in areas within the neighborhood. How can Excel help us get that information and who should we contact? So is this a question related to gardens or just a general baseline energy use for people? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 geographically so that they can, um, in general, be set up. Um, I don't know that, that that there is a process right now. I guess we could look at it. I could take that question and take it back to some other groups within the company. And I know there's, there's interest to, to understand loads and feeders and what the impact PV has and distributed generation has. So, but predicting the baseline for Uniform housing, I think, would be pretty simple. Um, I guess if it is in uniform housing, then you would have to look at individual bills and do that analysis. If you want to learn look at more public utilities commission packets, which I'm sure you're all excited to know, there's another packet related to you know, more and more communities are not just asking for energy data about their own operations, but about like, energy in their residence and other businesses in the city and county. There's a, a docket on, on the data privacy concerns with that and, and what what makes sense and what will there be more protections about. Um, and I believe that will come up from the commission uh, next spring. I cannot predict their schedules, but uh, there's a, a report out there about the working group's findings on that. So this is a, a common concern and I'm sure many groups that they have run into. Okay. And one of the things that Green Cities has done is partner with an effort called the Regional Indicators Project, and that is trying to use public data to gather information about energy usage within a city boundary. Um, and you know, that would be something that folks could look for in, on the Green Cities site or even just Google Regional Indicators. I think it's harder at a neighborhood level. I don't think that it's gone to that level of detail yet. It's more sort of city-wide. Um, but it's, it's another point of information. 
Mary Tukach again from Ramsey County. Um, are the rules for developers the same no matter their legal structure? So no matter if they're a co-op, a nonprofit, or a for-profit entity? The rule, the, the regulations on how they have to operate in Excel Energy Service Territory are, are the same. And I should point out that your list of presentation was great because it applies to all the, the models we're seeing out there. The Municipal Public Utilities Commission is only regulating the, the investor-owned utility offerings on this. So that's a lot of my presentation was focused on a lot of the requirements of PACI powder specific to uh, developers and offers working in Excel service territory. Um, that being said, the types of insurance you may need or some new security questions will be different depending on your, your profit status. Um, governments, you don't need security because you're considered sophisticated players. Um, so, you know, the tax implications of some of these as well, if you're not a taxable entity, it's you know, more straightforward in some cases. So, the general rules everyone's operating under are the same. Some of these, uh, the risks and the security questions are going to vary depending on your business model. Thank you. I have a clarification question on top of that one, too. Um, so earlier you said that the legislation enabled community solar statewide, um, but it only the only utility that was required to establish a program was Excel. Um, and then um, you said now that the PUC is only regulating the investor own utilities. So my question is, um, for some of these consumer, um, which is the information disclosure requirements, do those apply to the non-investor own utilities? Do we use co-ops? So if I if I'm in Greater Minnesota and I subscribe to a co-op um, or uh, or some other project in Greater Minnesota, will they have those same requirements to disclose insurance and other things? The answer is no, but I would, if I were in those areas as a potential subscriber, I would use this checklist and whoever says Excel put in my other utility and and, and get this information being an informed consumer. So that's what, you know, when we try working with her to make these resources applicable to all uh, community solar in the state, where it's specific to Excel, that's been noted. But generally, the, well, the information is it, just it's, it's requested um, anyway. I, I think one difference, though, is that your cooperative utility um, generally has been around for a rather long time, um, you know, since rural electrification. Um, and, and they're not planning to go anywhere. And so some of the questions about sort of your business model and staying power in the marketplace or what happens should you go out of business to that question earlier, some of those things, I mean, it's just that part of it, I mean, they're going to still be there. And it's your subscriber relationship is still with your utility. It's not with a third party. So. I would just say that's, that's one difference to keep in mind because you have that additional, it's not to say that you shouldn't ask many of the questions, but it's just that that part of it is a little bit different. Couldn't a cooperative utility use a developer, like do the Excel model? Yeah, so that you could still apply. Possibly. You're saying the cooperative would take over then if the developer went away or the subscription manager went away. For the, so for like right Hennepin or Candio High Power, they are the subscription manager. So they're, no, I mean they may have computer, so she says CEC is not doing it for right Hennepin. Um, CEC stands for Clean Energy Collective, and they're a solar developer out of Colorado, have done a lot of co ops there, now did right Hennepin. They have software tools and that sort of thing that they have given to Right Hennepin to use. So I mean, certainly, Right Hennepin probably has an agreement <laughs> with CEC that covers what happens if CEC goes out of business. All the tools that they're using, but because Right Hennepin already has a customer relationship and membership management database, they're having an existing standing relationship with those members. The members are now having another relationship with their co-op, but it's still with their Co-op. 
This is Eric with the Department of Commerce. I guess I've got a question about municipality or municipal utilities or co-ops in regards to the rates that they're going to offer the subscribers. Because Excel, it's kind of mandated. They're going to have to come up with on their own what that price structure would be that they would be paying as a credit. So that's, are there any resources that are available for municipalities or co-ops that are looking for how to structure that price? So the, the six projects, let's mention all the materials out there about them. I don't know if anyone collect, I believe Fresh Energy at one point may have collected some of the subscription pricing information and the rates that those offers are offering. So you can just do some calculations on based on those rates, you know, what the simple payback period may be for a subscriber and kind of maybe see some trends what how they're making those decisions. I should mention, I made it pretty clear that this isn't net metering. That means that you know, it isn't net metering Excel service territory. We have the rates set up. Cooperatives may pursue a net metering type of build structure, where it would be, I consumed 100 kilowatts, I produced to my subscription 90, so I paid for 10. They may do that. That's not what's in Excel territory, but I don't want to preclude that that may be the model. Um, but there's because they're cooperatives and municipal utilities, the reason was mentioned the Public Utilities Commission does not regulate their rates um, because they're member-owned. So we we have can get information from them, but it's not regulated. So in short, kind of in a way, you know, the Wild West is doing solar out there right now. I don't want to scare people with that, but it's also exciting to see what are some of the different business models and the rates and how can we make these projects as well. And, and just briefly, so there are six cooperative utility projects. There are many others that are in development. Um, as we understand it, there are several municipal utilities that have also been looking at how might this work, and there are some projects in development. But at this very moment, there are not any. There are no municipal utility community solar garden projects that are live in Minnesota. Okay. No, she brings from, uh, I'm working with MNIPL, um, and my... Can you say what that is for people who don't know? Oh, Minnesota Interface Power is Right. So um, I'm an energy member for the Minnesota Green Corps as well. So it's more focused on just congregations in general, but a question that I've had is, say, a, you know, a larger congregation group that has, like, good credit, all the financing, would they be able to somehow support or, like, share out their community solar share to a congregation that has worse credit or is not able to get the finances together at the front end? Is there a way to kind of share the share? You know what I mean? John, do you want to go first? Go. go first. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to be credited is their bill. So if you buy, if we get the description from the garden owner, whoever that is, and in, in this case, are you saying the garden owner is the congregation? Yes. Yeah. No. Okay. So the driver. Okay. Yes. Act driver. Well, and then some of them, too, were kind of questions about being the site as well. I think the question is about credit rate, like credit rating of CD. Just like how much you get if you sign up for a cell phone bill, they do a credit check on you. So if you're going to do a pay as you go model, and some of the developers are going to do a credit check on the subscribers, you're talking more on the credit worthiness, not the bill credit. Yes? Okay. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> so, so two different things. If, if the congregation wanted to be a host site, that's one transaction that the, the congregation would make with an operator and they would get a roof lease for up to Florida's point and they would ask all of those questions. And it could be that a different congregation or faith community could subscribe to the garden for which that congregation was a host site. But those are two different transactions. We 
Yes. I would say that as part of your negotiation of the host site, if you wanted to give a subscription to another congregation at no cost to them, so they would not need to be credit worthy, you could make that negotiation. Does that make sense? But, but then you might not get a lease payment for your stuff. Or you and, might. Right, right. And, and so, I mean, it's not, if you're a subscriber, you can't then give your subscription to someone else. You may find another financial arrangement to allow someone else to do it. But because it is your bill that gets the credit, you can't subscribe and then somehow give the bill credit to someone else via Excel. I mean, you could give them cash to help them cover their bill, or you could help them raise money to buy an upfront subscription or to put money into an account in escrow to pay in a pay-as-you-go model over time. But you can't donate your subscription to somebody else because it's tied to your utility bill account. I think you could, you could give it, give part of it or will it to them, right? Because it's going to win. Then I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, develop them for dollars. I look like you're going Anybody have a question? Okay, so one more. Uh, could you just, someone please review um, how many projects an entity can participate in under Excel territory? Is it's a definition of up to 5%? It's uh, up to 120% of the customer usage. So as many projects as you would care to subscribe to, as long as the total energy being subscribed to is not over 120%. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how many meters you have, doesn't, none of that matters. <clears throat> uh, You'd have to um, think about it as the credit on the bill as well. Uh, you'd have to spread this out over the different bills. Those subscriptions would have to be related to those bills. Thank you. I, I mean, uh, the phrase B3 hasn't been mentioned, but for cities, it's also for bills. counties also. Phil. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, just reminding everyone that obviously we have a free online tool for cities, county, schools, uh, so you can actually track all those meters and bills and the average crime, uh, you know, weather correction or not, uh, average usage. So, so we have a very, very simple, robust way to deal with uh, that average daily use and what 120 percent would be. So, uh, and obviously, it tells you to use that 120 percent broken. Okay, we have an online question. Yeah, I think this should be quick. Um, that so if a uh, subscriber already has solar partially covering their utility bill, will that be part of, will that be factored out of their average energy usage or is the solar included in for their 120%? If the net meter and they're producing um, power, the production from the PD system is a in most cases is absorbed by the, the building. So that reduces the amount of energy that they're pulling from the grid so that it would reduce their potential for the 120%. Okay, thank you. And then... I just, the, the statute also has additional language on that, that everything combined, your solar on site, your solar garden, some other we don't even know of yet, it, it can't be more than 120%, so what you get. It's everything. And then for cities in the room and online, Keith Schmidt says that she can help you with D3 if you have any questions. Hey, <laughs> baby. We have a kind of accounting, um, to get back to the subscriber portion of it, it was my understanding that a subscriber can be, um, you know, for instance, Hennepin County, but an individual department of Hennepin County can be one individual subscriber. So if Hennepin County has five departments within Hennepin County, each one of those can be a separate subscriber. 
Therefore, if you have a one megawatt system, Henry County could subscribe all five to them and be the full complete owner of that one megawatt system. Is that correct? <laughs> um, this isn't my program. I'm all over the board, and I know that's been discussed somewhat. It, I don't know that it fits that community solar idea of the program. You should talk to your Excel account representative on how they're classifying your account because this has been on. Uh, Debated topic um, with okay, and the whole whole document to the PUC about arguments about this, but Excel has put out a clarification document that we can point people to about how they interpret the definition of political subdivisions related to your accounts and your eligibility of subscribers. Um, the example they have clarified is in the state of Minnesota has. Department of Commerce, which control agency, and there's a UE the agency is this individual subscriber, not the state. Um, the only the, how this gets manifested is like you said, then doesn't change your hundred twenty percent, but it's how many subscriptions you can have in one garden or have to spread them out. And uh, there's a lot of there's questions remaining on that, but um, we can point you to point you to that uh, discussion and what Excel has said, but I would you know, get some specifics from your account representative. This is Diana, and I just know that in conversation, I don't think anybody here is from my account, but I think same question, does Metro Transit count as, like, can I, how do you break that up? What does that mean? And how do you go forward if you're a really big energy user? Um, so that's a really, I think, important point. It sounds like maybe there's not a final answer. So working on how that works. I, I'm not a lawyer. There's a lot of legal language in that norm um, that I, I personally like to see clarified because the question is going to come up. There's a, a, one side of it is that the name is community solar garden. So wasn't a, some people say it wasn't intended for um, Henderson County agency to take up one garden. Is that a community garden? On the other hand, there's how does this work in practice in the administrative part of it and getting, getting this done um, and crediting the correct account. So uh, let's you know, circle back on that. And if, if there's more clarification from Excel, I hope we can share it with the group. And I think that's really good. I think probably most of the cities that we work with as the audience for this might not have that much of an issue. But um, when it gets to the local government, you know, counties, others, so thank you for that. County, do you have a question? Yeah, Tony. <clears throat> with Anaheim County, I have a question on um, the compliance check. And I'm wondering, so there's a triggering event, and then there's a compliance check. Um, is that strictly a true event, or does that open the contract? A raising question, and what all, what all happens? That's the part that needs to be specified in your contract. And we're working with Excel on clarifying so the market has clarity on the, the regulatory side, what effect does that have for how Excel would credit your subscription? Because now you're out of compliance with the program. And so is it that the part is out of compliance, the 5%, is it 25%, is that not credited? Is the whole thing not credited? If you want to talk with your operator and look at the contract language, um, to see how that works. I'll just say that it's important point to note. It's really only, it's only going to manifest itself in a county or city goes 100, you know, subscribe full board, and then they're going to relocate to other facilities, which probably could happen in 25 years. But you may want to be more conservative in your subscription size. You're not 120 percent, but you can only go 100 percent on or less than that, that's part of your subscription sizing conversation you want to have. Um, but you know, a lot of focus and attention to put on it because we want to get it clarified and clear. But the reality is unless you're really don't call by the program doing huge subscription and you've got a lot of moving going on, it's not likely going to be a problem for you. Um, so follow up if I could on that. Um, related, 
So there's a large entity, say, um, a retailer or um, a bank or a healthcare sort of operation that has lots and lots of sites. Um, so so they they enter into a 25-year agreement. Um, they have subscriptions. They also have a large conservation program, so they're constantly um, watching their consumption. But they also that subscriber also then um, doesn't change anything related to the subscription, but um, they shut down operations, they open new operations, their consumption remains roughly the same, maybe you know, give or take ten percent or whatever. But so you suggested something in your response, Holly, that moving operations or new operations might be a triggering event. Is that the case? Even if it's not related necessarily to the contract itself. I'm going through my PUC orders here to find the language on it, but the, the commission did detail uh, what triggers that check. They made it clear when they looked at this issue in April of this year, they didn't want to discourage energy conservation. So the check wasn't going to happen every year because. Your energy use, if you had a lower due to weather, maybe because you've done efficiency measures, and we don't want to um, penalize subscribers for those things. Weather happens, and efficiency is good. That being said, there is 120% in the statute, so it has to be compliant with it. And so the commission decided that it'll, you check in again. You only need to check in again if you can change your subscription size, you can buy more, you can sell it off, or if you move addresses. The address then you get the subscription subscribers mm -hmm. move. But you're going to change you're at this address and then you're going to move here so your account address has changed. That's going to trigger the hundred twenty percent compliance. The practical matter is you don't have twenty four months of historical data at your new address because you just moved there. So I uh, felt can use their estimated data based on the facility type and size figure out what 120% may look like. Oh, I just want to clarify, because what I hear you saying is contract, and I think that contract is between you and the developer. The compliance check is a trigger between the developer and Excel Energy. Does that make sense? So, and, and when she says your address changes, that is just, from what I understand, one account address, and then for like cities, there's a lot of addresses, there's a lot of meters, but I believe there's only one main address for the account. But, I mean, that could be fuzzy for any cities. Okay. All right. Good question. Oh, wait, John's got one more answer. What's being credited is the bill. So if something changes on the, um, and how are the bill structured, it can vary. Lot. But if something changes from the customer's perspective on the bill, in order for the um, garden owner to make that change, they have to go into the software system that we have and say that, okay, this is not being credited over here, it's not being credited over here. So they're going to look at, at this other bill to credit it, and that's where the 120% check is going to make. So if you change addresses, if you, if, if the um, garden uh, owner wants, do you request that your subscription be lowered? That has to be uh, adjusted on the bill. So it's really the bill, any changes to the bill is what's really going to trigger the 120%. Thank you. Yes, Ron. I have a question. I think it's for Holly. I recall seeing a slide that uh, showed the uh, rates for 2015. Um, I just wanted to confirm that those rates were the credit to the subscriber, and that there was those were redone yearly. Can you tell us a little bit more about how they're redone? And I'm guessing it won't be a term of the contract if it's a variable change in rate. So the Statute I see in the that it has to be at the applicable retail rate um, until this, uh, unless the value of solar rate I mentioned earlier is approved, it's not. So um, that's, 
sell calculates by taking the previous year's revenue from each customer class, residential, um, small, general, and then the general class, and to look on your bill to figure out what class term. You take the revenues by by the sales, so it's going to be getting the revenue data from 2014 right now, and then I believe that the date, I thought they had pretty confident is March 1st, they're going to update their price based on the previous year. So the 2014 rates we're calling them will be in place until March 1st, and 2015 rates will kick in. So if you had a subscription right now, the rates you're going to be credited at with the update in 20 March, go through the following March, and then you update again. And of course, about to 25 years. So the rec prices that we talked about, the interest rates, those recs are set for the life of the contract. That two or three cents. So it sounds like it's going to grow in parity with energy costs. Is that fair? It will, it will move in tandem in the general direction. Yep. Um, there's no price floor on it, so it's, you know, it, the theory it could go down. Uh, well, not likely, but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's about trying to, you know, there's a lot of rates out there that you may have on your bills. It was too, being too complicated to match it exactly to the rate you get, so it had these three general rate classes. And the idea is that the applicable retail rate of that class, which will likely increase due to inflation and other costs moving forward. No guarantees, so you get no guarantees on a regulator. <coughs> We're over. I didn't want to cut it off because there were so many good questions, but I do want to formally answer some presenters need to move on and some people have been walking. A couple people have left the room and I don't probably some people have left the phone. This has been a great conversation. This will be on our, the Greek at the website at some point in the near future. We'll send out a follow-up with information. Thank you all for your participation. Let's please thank the panel for their <laughs> Thank